I've been a beauty model for more than 30 years, long before Photoshop and Facetune were apps on a smartphone. Lana Ogilvie wrote on her website, the Torontonian Caribbean Canadian supermodel has indeed seen it all and been around some of the world's biggest and brightest stars in the industry, while she herself is a trailblazing icon. Lana Ogilvie, the daughter of Grenadian Canadian Robert Victor Ogilvie, a prominent Toronto surgeon, and Jamaican Canadian Hazel Ogilvie, an accomplished organist. In the mid 80s, Ogilvie was attending high school at the elite all girls private school, Havergill College in Toronto, when she was first spotted by Elmer Olson, one of Canada's most renowned model scouts at the age of 17. Olson, who was representing elite model management at the time, noticed Ogilvie while she was walking at all things, a fashion show at her school. It really must have been written in the stars. She was immediately whisked away to New York City and before she knew it, she was residing at Eileen Ford's home with Christy Turlington and Naomi Campbell. Not long after, she was securing bookings for 10 to 12 shows per season in Paris and Milan. Ogilvie has striking girl next door good looks, captivating hazel eyes, legs for days, and stands tall at 5'10". She has the classic model frame. As one publication put it, quote, she's as curvy as a twig. Ogilvie has appeared on the covers and inside the pages of Vogue magazines, Flair magazine, Fashion magazine, Mary Claire, Glamour, Elle, and walked countless runways for Christian Dior, Prada, Gucci, Calvin Klein, Issey Miyake, as well as ad campaigns for Ralph Lauren, Bergdorf Goodman, DKNY, Victoria's Secret, Virginia Slims, and Guess. The list goes on and on and on, even appearing in Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. Ogilvie even has a connection to the British Royals. In 1989, she shot a Josephine Baker-inspired editorial for Vogue UK that was photographed by Anthony Armstrong Jones, better known as the Earl of Snowden, Princess Margaret's ex-husband. In 1992, Ogilvy, then 23 years old, made history by being the first black model to be given an exclusive multi-year deal with CoverGirl Cosmetics less than six years after she was spotted in high school. The news garnered international attention and cemented Ogilvy's place in history. She then joined the ranks of CoverGirl ambassadors with multi-year deals such as Christy Brinkley, Carol Alt, and Rachel Hunter. For models, beauty campaigns are the holy grail, which is why they are so highly sought after. These contracts are supposed to offer visibility and the huge payday that go along with it. An official from CoverGirl addressed the media when the deal was made public, saying, quote, Lana Ogilvie typifies the natural beauty image that is an integral part of the CoverGirl heritage. We are constantly in search of models who convey a clean, fresh, natural look and who also possess the radiant personality that Lana has. We are delighted to have her join our family of top cover girl models." End quote. The signing of Ogilvy was no accident. It was during this time that major cosmetics companies began to pay closer attention to black consumers, particularly black women. The results of the market research were unmistakable. Black consumers were spending a lot of money on non-essential retail. Black women then were a chronically underserved group when it came to cosmetic products. Most coverage options lacked shades and deeper tones. Surprisingly, the only businesses that offered them any options were direct-to-consumer companies like Avon and Mary Kay and niche makeup companies that catered specifically to Black women. At the time, CoverGirl's tagline was Redefining Beautiful. Ogilvy was the first Black CoverGirl of the company's 32-year history. Large cosmetic companies rushed to recruit Black women to serve as their brand ambassadors after seeing that Black women contributed 
four billion to the industry in the 90s, which would be equivalent to eight billion now with inflation. Other reasons for the rush to cater to black women in the market was that these companies saw that black women consumers in the beauty space were getting younger at the prime marketing age of the 18 to 34 year range. These women were also better educated and more affluent than before. And the black female population was growing at twice the rate of white women. All of these factors are reasons why large cosmetic brands began to seriously cater to black women in order to enhance their bottom line. Before 92, there were just four cosmetics brands for black women in North American department stores. Many cosmetic companies raced for a piece of the action from the upscale department store brands like Fashion Fair and Prescriptives to lower priced drugstore staples like Revlon and Maybelline. In the same year of 92, Revlon signed then 24-year-old supermodel Veronica Webb to a three-year $2.2 million contract equivalent to $4.6 million now with inflation, making her the first black model to secure a beauty contract with a major cosmetics firm. In fact, the signings of Webb to Revlon and Ogilvy to CoverGirl were so close in timing both inked in June 92, that it was debated for a period as to who was the first to be signed and deserving of the title of first black model to be signed to a major cosmetics company. Though Ogilvy was signed in June 92, the details of her contract were never revealed and CoverGirl didn't make her signing public until the fall of 92. When Revlon signed Veronica Webb, she became the company's first black model spokesperson in its 30-year history. When it came to integrating black consumers in the market in a more visible way, a Revlon spokesperson declared, this is the future of cosmetics. Everyone knows that. This is definitely not a short-term investment for Revlon. When criticized for their sudden interest in the black consumer and possibly driving out smaller cosmetics companies that had long catered to black women, a marketing executive noted, if it's a poor product, it's a poor product and consumers aren't going to buy it no matter who makes it, end quote. Estee Lauder was a late comer signing supermodel Leah Kabide in 2003, making her the brand's first black model to be handed a big beauty contract in its 57 year history at the time, despite being one of the leading cosmetic brands to be more inclusive to black consumers during the 90s. In his book, Black Beauty, A History and Celebration, published in 2000, Ben Argundade examined the phenomena of the mainstreaming of black beauty and cosmetics for black consumers by large beauty conglomerates that traditionally prioritized white consumers during the 90s, saying, Quote, these promotions keenly illustrated the extent to which the marketability of black beauty had evolved. But once again, the question of the style of beauty being pushed was still an issue. With the exception of Alec Weck, these campaigns exclusively promoted a world of Europeanized aesthetic values in an unbalanced ratio that left ethnic beauty at the gate. End quote. According to a piece in Adweek, CoverGirl put Ogilvy to a focus group before signing her and launching its Women of Color collection. Ogilvy remarked on her CoverGirl signing at the time in a 2018 article about the changes in the fashion industry for Black women who worked in it then and now, saying, quote, The CoverGirl contract was an amazing highlight of my career, but my agents had to fight tooth and nail to get me standard cosmetic contract provisions. In those days, makeup companies put a lot of pressure on magazines. Why do you think Cindy Crawford was on so many covers during that time? Because Revlon made sure she was." End quote. Signing Ogilvy to this contract meant that she would be featured in ad campaigns for CoverGirl that were in all spaces, not just spaces designated for black audiences and consumers. For instance, Ogilvy's appearance in numerous CoverGirl magazine placements made Ogilvy by default the first known black model to be featured in Canadian 
women's magazine Chatelaine in its 66 year existence as a result of a 94 ad campaign for the CoverGirl's Luminous Lip Color range. In 94, Ogilvy received public recognition from CoverGirl mainstay Christy Brinkley for entering the exclusive club, saying, as I enter my 17th year with CoverGirl, I'm pleased to be sharing the spotlight with such beautiful women as Nikki Taylor, Rachel Hunter, Tyra Banks, and Lana Ogilvy, end quote. These achievements, like the CoverGirl contract, were meant to establish Ogilvy as a household name and make her fabulously wealthy, but that wasn't exactly what happened. In 2021, Ogilvy revealed the following in the article titled, They Invented Supermodel, for New York's magazine's The Cut. Before I got my CoverGirl contract, I modeled for five years just doing editorial, being broke, and it was huge. I was the first ethnic woman. They had not put anybody who wasn't white under contract before. CoverGirl, unlike Revlon, made sure the ads were in all the magazines. My ads were not just in black magazines, they were across the board. That hadn't really happened. But CoverGirl did not compensate me equitably by any stretch of the imagination. I got much less than the white contract models were getting. They said, take it or leave it, end quote. By the time CoverGirl announced its historic partnership with Ogilvy, she was already back on the runway for the spring-summer 93 season doing shows in Milan. Over the course of the 1990s, Ogilvy campaigned for more black model inclusion by joining industry veteran and icon Beth Ann Hardison's Black Girl Coalition, which Hardison founded with supermodel Iman and which sought to bring attention to the lack of black representation in the fashion industry while also celebrating the black models who were making a mark in the industry. Hardison credits Regis Pagniers, the founder of Elle magazine's US branch, as a fervent supporter and ally of the initiative by including more black models in editorials for LUS. In the early 2000s, after returning to Toronto with her husband and daughter after three years in the Dominican Republic for her husband's land development projects, Ogilvy found herself in front of the camera in a considerably different role. After an unsuccessful story pitch to fashion television, Moses Neymar, a scion and mogul of Canadian broadcasting, saw Ogilvy's real and personally contacted her to offer her the hosting position in what can only be described as another instance of serendipity. Ogilvy had her own fashion segment on fashion television in 2002 as a correspondent and host of This Week in Fashion, which provided commentary and features on fashion with designer profiles and fashion trends, and she co-hosted another segment, The Review, with Glenn Baxter, which was a weekly show about the fashion industry. She was a model first and foremost, and she was still balancing her hosting duties while also working as a part-time model. When questioned about her new responsibilities at fashion television, she stated, a camera's a camera. I hosted Soul Train once and did live morning shows when I got the CoverGirl contract. I'm used to being on camera and talking without a script, end quote. Of her personal style off-duty, Ogilvy remarked that I'm eclectic, one day I'll dress East Village chic, and the next I'll be Euro preppy. She kept her eclectic style even after becoming a mom and was rocking stylish non-mom clothes before Rihanna. Quote, I wear heels three out of five days and my hair has been bleached, spiky, short and long. Even though I have a child, I still want to look hip. Ogilvy is a true fashionista, having amassed an impressive wardrobe that includes items by Alaya, Helmut Lang, Costume National, Isaac Mizrahi, Christian Louboutin, Manola Blahnik, and we're talking pre-sex in the city, Dior, Stussy, Paul Frank, Triple Five Soul, on and on it goes. Even her wedding dress was custom made for her by THE John Galliano during a time when she was frequently working with the legendary designer. The wedding gown was described as having a deep V-neck 
in the back and being made of chiffon with white on top that ombre into lilac at the bottom. The Sunday Times in the UK noted in 92 that Ogilvy was a favorite of legendary fashion designer Issey Miyake. Ogilvy took to social media after his death in the summer of 2022, writing, Very sad to hear of Issey Miyake's passing. I worked with him many times doing runway shows as well as a campaign for wind coats with the photographer Tien. He was a genius and humble, always pushing the boundaries and innovating, a really singular talent in the world of design. When asked how the modeling world has evolved or not changed in her opinion, she stated, Certainly, in regards to representation, everyone is trying to be more inclusive. It's not necessarily equal representation, but more inclusive representation. You may have a certain number of white models in a shot along with one Asian or black model because you wouldn't normally have two of those ethnicities in one group, right? That doesn't make sense. So while people are striving for more inclusivity and more diversity, it's not always equal. End quote. Ogilvy is now a serial entrepreneur in the skincare and jewelry industries. She's hardly a newcomer to organic beauty. When reporters asked her about her approach to self-care in the 90s at age 25, she talked about her beauty routine sharing, quote, one thing I like to do is take hot baths with oils, where she noted that such oils as Arnica, Eucalyptus, and Ylang Lang are her favorite antidotes for soothing muscle tension with incense burning in the background. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that Ogilvy founded and serves as CEO of Lana Ogilvy Cosmetics, a line of organic skincare she launched in 2019. She makes jewelry as well. Between her demanding modeling schedule in the 90s and her studies in fine art illustration at Concordia University in Montreal, she began her path to the jewelry industry. She later studied jewelry making at Studio Jewelers Limited in New York City before launching her own line, Sabre Jewelry, in 2016. Her Sabre Jewelry line was a part of the Emerging Designers Diamond Initiative of the Natural Diamonds Council in 2021. She is now obtaining a certification in diamond grading at the Gemological Institute of America while also enrolled in the prestigious jewelry design program at the Fashion Institute of Technology. And oh yeah, she still models. Ogilvy said when asked about her outlook on life, quote, there will always be something to worry about. If you spend all your time thinking about what ifs, you'll never do anything. Just deal with things as they come. If you enjoy this video, please like, subscribe, comment your thoughts, and check out these other Canuck Catwalk videos. If you really want to help, please consider supporting the channel. Links are in the description. Thank you for watching.